Hi, this is Roger from Kanker Labs with the third episode about precision op-amp design. Now, before we start a new topic like noise and input offset voltage and etc. etc. Um, there was one viewer who pointed out that I made uh, two errors and he was absolutely correct and that concerned how to calculate here with the input impedance. You might remember with the chosen values for the input resistors and the input AC coupling capacitor, uh, we got a corner frequency of around 11 Hz to get our condition that we get a flatness of uh, better or equal than 0.1 dB at or starting from 1 kHz etc. upwards. Uh, now when I made the measurements with uh, the multimeter of the frequency response, I was wondering, well, there should have been, with the original values of 100K for these resistors and 100 nanofarad, there should have been a slightly larger than 0.1 dB attenuation at 1 kHz, but we didn't observe that, and that was, should have been a hint for me to think one more time about the three compo components here. Ah, so let's take a closer look what, uh, what error I made. So if we don't draw it that way, the combination of the two resistors and the capacitor, but we just exchange R1 and C1. That makes no difference because they are in series, uh, so it, it it doesn't matter if R1 or C1 is in front, then it looks like that. And this is our basically our high pass filter, just drawn differently. And now we can see the resistance here that becomes effective in the high pass filter is not only R2, but R1 and R2 are in series, so because they are both at 10 kilo ohms, we get a corner frequency. The, the formula, of course, is the same. 1 on 2 pi times R times C. But this time R is not R2, but the sum of R1 and R2. And if we put in the values, um, we get a minimum required capacitance for C1 to give our desired flatness. First of all, of not 1.5 microfarad, but 750 nanofarad. And when we choose the double value, we don't get a corner frequency of 11 Hz, but 5.5 Hz. So, looking at the other way around, the original values the engineers at ELV choose, namely 100K, 100K and 100 nanofarad, was in fact absolutely sufficient uh, to give this 0.1 dB flatness. I just made an error in calculating the corner frequency uh, of the high pass filter by just not taking R1 into account. So you see how easy it is to get some little error creeping in and um, you see, can see in the background the simulation with LT Spice, uh, which gives exactly the same value of course. So it's uh, quite often good to have uh, your result double checked for example with a simulation or a viewer who points out an error. And the second thing I said wrongly was if you want to get rid of, of this one-to-one -one voltage divider which, which gives you an attenuation of minus 6 dB you could enlarge R2, um, for example, to 1 mec ohm, then you would have basically no attenuation, but then the noise from R2 becomes important. And we'll talk later about 
noise. Um, here it's sufficient to know um, the noise from a resistor increases with the square root of the value, which means a 10 mech ohm, which is a thousand fold of the 10 K, which we have here, would give the square root of 1000 or approximately 30 times more noise. And it has other detrimental effects to choose to choose such large resistors. But also um, it was pointed out, well, but the noise, if you increase this resistor, is of no importance because the noise is shorted out by R1. Now you may say, what? But R1 is in series with R2, so how can R1 sh short out the noise of R2? Well, never forget, here, <coughs> here you have your voltage source at your input, and th this is always a low impedance source, like a power amplifier or a pre-amplifier with, let's say, 1 ohm, 10 ohm or 100 ohm anyway, much, much lower than this. And it's, of course, also uh, connected to ground. So this circuit can also be drawn as R2 goes to ground. And then we have R1, C1, and our voltage source also connected to ground and you can see now because the impedance of oops <laughs> that way you can see it better the impedance of c1 uh, we know it's at the frequencies that we we are dealing with one kilohertz and upwards is nearly zero uh, so you can leave this out and the voltage source has a ne negligible impedance compared to r1 and r2 so we have basically R1 in parallel to R2. And now no matter what noise R2 generates, it's simply shorted out by R1. And so resistor noise of R2, at the moment when you connect your voltage source, doesn't come into play. And if you still own or have owned a record player and a preamplifier um, for your record player, you can watch an effect if you have the record player not connected to your stereo amplifier and turn on the volume pot uh, full, you, you will hear a certain amount of noise generated by the input impedance and the amplifiers behind that, etc. But as soon as you connect your record player with its own impedance of the, of the moving coil or moving magnet cartridge, which is much lower than the input impedance, which is typically 47K for a mo moving magnet input, as soon as you connect it, the noise from your input resistance is shorted out by the much smaller than usually a few hundred ohms of your stereo cartridge and your noise gets lower because your, the impedance of your input of your um, phono cartridge shorts out the resistor noise of the input of your amplifier. So an, an effect you can not only measure, but you can hear it with an old or new, depending on when you bought it, stereo amplifier with, with the phono uh, inputs. So now that we are already talking about noise, we will hear and in most other cases have to deal with three sources of noise. The first and the hardest to get rid of is noise pickup from stray electric and magnetic fields, so from the outside world. Uh, we'll deal with that 
uh, just in a minute. The second is resistor noise. So every resistor that is connected in the signal path, uh, you have to take care uh, about the noise generated in the resistor itself. This is something dictated by physics. You can't do anything about it except choose a as low as possible resistor value because as I already said it grows with the square root of your resistor value. At least the voltage grows with the square root of your resistor value. So again, as we have already seen, choosing the lowest possible resistor is always a good idea. And the th third is the noise in your op amp or transistor or whatever, but here we're dealing with op amps. And that you can control, of course, by the selection of your op amp, but there are also limitations by physics because even the best available ultra low noise op amp can't beat the laws of physics. Well it can do a little bit um, but basically you, the physics limits and the the availability of and of course the cost of uh, ultra low noise op amps dictates what you can do about this factor. So, and then I don't forget it, um, in the second and third noise source, you will always find that your noise is proportion, also proportional to the square root of your bandwidth. Um, so, th this is also something you can control of. In our example, we only need here a bandwidth from 1 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz because at 1 kilohertz will be our fundamental tone our sine wave uh, for measuring the distortions and the highest harmonics that we that were interesting in it is at 20 kilohertz so we could and we should limit the bandwidth in our circuit to this range, if we don't do it, and let's suppose we design our op amp circuit to work up to the megahertz region, which is totally unnecessary, then your noise will be greater simply by choosing a too large bandwidth. So you should always limit your bandwidth when noise is important uh, to the frequency range that you're dealing with in your circuit. And this is uh, quite easy because we will also in another episode see that you have a lot of unwanted low pass filters. So remember just an example. You have a resistor and you always have stray capacitance down to ground. So even if you don't actively do something to limit your bandwidth, you, you will have to care about uh, by parasitic capacitance, uh, which are omnipresent, that you always get low passes. And it's sometimes the other way is the hard way, getting a high enough bandwidth if you're dealing with radio frequency circuits, just not to have any low pass filters, any unwanted low pass filters. So if we want to limit our bandwidth, it's uh, very simple. We at one place or another, uh, we just have to add simply a capacitor to ground behind a resistor and we have a low pass filter which cuts off any high frequency uh, noise or our circuit is by design a low pass filter in itself or it, it can't perhaps deal with frequencies above 20 kilohertz or let's say above 50 kilohertz. That doesn't matter because it goes with the with the square root. A factor of two doesn't make out much because it translates only to a the square root of two to a factor of 1.41 uh, when it comes to the 
noise generated by too high a bandwidth. So um, just remember two things. Resistor noise, at least the voltage, not the noise power, the voltage goes with the square root of the resistor value and resistor noise and the noise in your op amp are also proportional to the square root of your chosen bandwidth or not of your chosen of the true bandwidth uh, at the at the output of your circuit. Uh, we'll see some examples of that later. So let's first deal with noise pickup from external sources. So your basic setup will always look like this. You have a source, a low voltage source, which could be the stereo pickup of your record player or any other low voltage source. It could be the output of an amplifier where we want to measure the distortion. It could be a frequency, frequency generator, etc. And then you have an amplifying circuitry. That's our what we are dealing with, a pre-amplifier, your measurement circuitry, etc. And you somehow have to connect them and you want to do this without getting any stray fields, any noise pickup from your source to your receiver. So, easy as, as that, the first thing that comes to mind is you're using a shielded cable. This could be a phono RCR or cinch plug cable, it could be a BNC cable or whatever. So you might think, well, if I'm using a shielded cable, then I don't have to care about noise pickup. Well, the first thing you should know is there are basically two ways how noise pickup could creep via the cable or any other way into your circuit. One thing are electrical fields and what's sometimes forgotten are magnetic fields. And a shielded cable only shields electrical fields. So what about the magnetic fields? We will deal with how to get a kind of shielding for magnetic fields uh, just in a few minutes, but uh, remember this. The classical shielded cable can only shield your signal line from electrical fields not from magnetic fields. Basically there is no real way to shield magnetic fields. There is uh, something called mu metal, uh, but this is not suitable for cables. You can shield a little bit transformer magnetic fields, power transformer magnetic fields with mu metal casings, etc. Um, but this is not possible for your connection for your cable. So already at this point, what do you do if you have stray magnetic fields and you have them everywhere? The 50 or 60 hertz power line, they not only emit 50 or 60 hertz electrical fields, but as well magnetic fields as soon as current is flowing. And in your household or in your lab, there are a lot of currents flowing around. We won't deal here with electromagnetic waves. I've also dealt with that in another video series, which I'll give you the link. So, um, but there's something else. As you might know, the shield of your cable is connected with the local ground of your circuit. So on the one side with your source, and on the other side, it's connected with local ground of your amplifying circuit. Well, at the moment, that is no problem. But you usually have both 
of them connected to your mains power. And also this is not a problem, but if you have also a metal case, which is of course preferable because again it gives you electrical shielding. So that's the reason why most sensitive voltage sources as well as sensitive amplifiers are encased in a metal case just to give you an extra shielding. Um, again only a shielding against electrical fields and not against magnetic fields. Now there are laws that dictate if you use a metal case and you have a mains connected device it must be connected to protective earth. First problem here is so not only your device is connected, the case itself is connected to protective earth. And well, protective earth itself is a signal source, source simply because it's like an antenna. It's meters or kilometers long and picks up every noise flying around, starting from your own generated noise by every switch mode power supply nearby. Um, so noise comes just by having a metal case and a mains connection. You always have an additional noise source coming here in from protective earth. There are or there is some hi-fi stereo equipment which do have a little switch which is called ground lift and this little switch is doing something that is forbidden because it is inserted here and it switches off the connection of your metal case to protective earth. Now then you get away with some of the noise and with another another effect which we uh, explain now but I just tell you this is forbidden. Now what if if your sensitive preamplifier is also in a metal case of course because of the shielding and in case this is also mains powered it of course must also be connected to protective earth and that way because they itself are by a few meters of cable connected you have a double connection of your ground from your source to your receiver via the shielded cable which is connected to local ground and local ground is again connected to protective earth and that way you get here a connection via the cable and the same connection here via protective earth and that can cause and usually causes what is called ground loops and you might have experienced this if you have a uh, stereo equipment with many devices um, then sometimes for example if you connect a tuner to your preamplifier or power amplifier you suddenly get additional hum 50 or 60 Hertz hum or any other uh, noise and if you disconnect the the phono cable the noise is gone so just by connecting the cable you get additional hum and the reason is are these ground loops. So how to avoid it? Well, if you have battery powered equipment then you can have a metal case and you have of course then no connection to protective earth so your ground loop is gone. Uh, but it's not always possible um, to use battery 
powered devices. So the second best thing would be changing to a plastic case. Now, of course, you lose at first look the shielding effect of the metal case, but you also get away with ground loops. And there are these aerosols, these sprays, like this one here. This is a copper spray. I'll just uh, read out to you what the, the description for shielding of plastic housings protects against electromagnetic interference in brackets EMI and improves the electromagnetic compatibility. EMI 35, that's the name of the aerosol, provides a highly conductive coating which adheres well to the surface, easy to apply, dries quickly. And in fact, this is kind of a sprayable copper. It's really, there's copper uh, um, left when you spray it and let it dry. So you have an inside of your plastic case, you have again your, your, uh, your shielding, your metal, con all connected metal surface, but not touchable because it's inside your plastic case. And that you can safely connect now to your local ground. So a plastic case plus a, how shall we call it, uh, conductive shielding aerosol or uh, coating. Yeah, let's let's take coating because it could be also uh, graphite or how is it called in, in English? Uh, or there are other materials that you that are that you can simply spray on the inside of your plastic case. Uh, so whenever, and of course, if you do it at your home lab, you're of course free to insert your ground lift switch by your own. But I can't advise it. You have <laughs> that's at your own risk. So let's sum it up. Um, we have to deal with noise pickup from outside sources and in modern households there are so many sources of noise from mains noise starting at 50 or 60 hertz up to the gigahertz range. You, you know the effect of your mobile phone when it tries to connect to the base station that you hear it in, in all of your amplifiers. Is did -did 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 -did. Um, you see, it's not not very easy uh, to shield your circuitry from your source to at least the first real amplifying stage of your measurement or amplifying or pre-amplifying circuitry to shield it really perfect. And in my experience, shielding the cable from magnetic fields or having a means to cancel out elect magnetic fields is more important than shielding it from electrical fields. Shielding from electrical fields is easy with a shielded cable, but it's not enough because quite often magnetic fields are the major source of outside noise pickup. There, twisted cable is better. Now, of course, a magnetic field will induce a current in each of the two leads. But because they interchange their position, they cancel out from each crossing to the next and your total induced voltage becomes very small. So, and quite often I've experienced that magnetic fields are more of a problem as a noise source than electrical fields. And what is the best? Well, can't we do a combination? Of course, you get special audio cables um, which either shield each single line of your twisted pair of your twisted cable or have a common or even both. So you could you could really do a lot of shielding. You could first have a twisted cable. Each wire 
is separately shielded and then you have a common shield around your single shielded twisted pair and um, my experience is I've built, home built a high-end hi-fi stereo amplifier with a moving coil input amplifier and if you know a little bit about uh, hi-fi phono amplifiers you know you're dealing there with nanovolts of input voltage and you have to keep out any noise sources below let's say one nanovolt and I've used all the best techniques that I knew of and you have absolutely no 50 or 60 hertz hum or noise pick up absolutely nothing uh, the only noise you hear is the thermic resistor noise from the 100 ohm input impedance so th this is basically the proof I've used here this twisted cable even without any further shielding inside the preamp and there's absolutely no noise uh, so it's uh, you just have to try out and you can combine these two concepts so th this is rarely described in um, in guidebooks concerning uh, op amps how to keep away external noise sources simply with the right selection of your cable and because it fits a little bit into this theme let's finally talk for today about power supply consideration grounding and um, well one thing you will know is that you should bypass or you should put at any op amp bypass capacitors at the power supply connections now let's take a look at the circuit and you don't see any no no bypass capacitors at the op amps. Well, how can that be? They have simply not drawn them here in the circuit. If we take a look at the real PCB, you can see there are in fact a lot of bypass electrolytics of uh, 10 microfarad, but um, they are not placed where they should be placed, directly at the power supply inputs of the op amps they are strewn all over I've already mentioned this uh, in another video as far as I remember and where are the 100 nanofarad in parallel to the 10 microfarads I've already shown you this in the repair video I've placed them manually here I've soldered them uh, on the lower side of the PCB uh, so, um, this is not optimum. How should it look? Let's take again a new piece of paper. So, I'm sure uh, you have seen many times this power supply decoupling for an op amp or any other linear circuit. A parallel combination of a quite often a 10 microfarad electrolytic with a, nine, a 100 nanofarad ceramic or multi-layer ceramic capacitor. Don't forget that at the negative, if you have split supplies, so a plus and a minus and not plus and ground for single supply op amps, if you have split supplies just to reverse the electrolytic here on the V minus side that happened to me so many times I don't know how how many uh, electrolytics I've blown this way uh, so but there's a first of all you might have the questions why parallel two of them well I've made a separate video uh, where this is explained in very great detail because no single capacitor is able to suppress noise at a very large frequency range. So electrolytics are good up to let's say 100 kilohertz but then uh, they start to degrade due to their internal parasitic capacitance and ESR etc and then uh, ceramic capacitors take over and paralleling them just gives you a good EMI RFI 
suppression up to the megahertz range. So that is a standard pr procedure, but in precision op-amp circuits there is another little trick. You add a series resistor in the range between 1 and 100 ohms. The typical value is 10 ohms before you connect it to V plus and V minus and this gives additional noise suppression. Why? Well, this series resistor in combination with these two capacitors make a low pass filter uh, so any noise that is present here uh, on the V plus or on the V minus line is, uh, is filtered out by 20 dBs or more depending on which values you choose. And let's suppose um, you have somewhere a noise source which is also with noise source I mean for example a, uh, a, a digital logic IC or uh, an op amp that is switching heavy currents etc. And this is of course also connected to V plus and if this also has the series resistor with the capacitor then you have two low pass filters which simply kind of disconnect your local op amp from the noise present on the V plus or V minus line when there is our noise sources uh, somewhere else located in your circuitry. So and the last thing perhaps to know about your power supply is if possible use linear regulators like the 7879 series or the LM317 etc. And if you have a split power supply, even if you have to use switch mode power supplies, you can put a linear regulator just behind them. Um, so the switch mode power supplies just are there for their e efficiency, but they usually produce a lot of noise. Although there are some new low noise switch mode power supply chips out. Uh, but it's always a good idea, idea to have a linear regulator uh, just as the last thing before it goes to your or which is your main V plus and V minus source. Now you should add some little protection which look like this because you always have to take care of your precision op amps especially if they are expensive types to protect them from power supply reversal and this is a simple three diode protection which looks like this So the first diode, which it's sufficient to have a 1N400X uh, diode, it protects um, here the V plus side from supply reversal so that you don't get any negative voltages here. The same is here for the negative supply with a diode pointing in the other direction to ground. Uh, to protect your V minus against positive voltages and then between the two a third diode um, so nothing can happen if any of the regulators break or you get any strange behavior your op amp circuitry is always uh, protected. And there is a final consideration and that is avoiding so-called ground loops. Well you can see we ha we've had this problem already here where we had a ground loop because we had a double connection of the local circuit grounds via the shielded cable grounds and the protective earth in case both 
devices are connected to protective earth. And this happens again on your PC, uh, PCB. Uh, just look how many connections to ground we already here have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you have many more. And you, you can't avoid um, ground loops finally at all. But there are two tricks and the easiest one is to use a so-called star ground. So here in the original circuit is an example of how not to do it. Um, look, we have already at the inputs three, uh, three of the four millimeter banana sockets are connected to ground and the on the PCB, which is a single-sided PCB, so uh, you don't have to see the other side, the traces are all on this side. Uh, you can see, well, the thick lines here, this is all uh, ground, and you see how often it branches off, so you have certainly a lot of, well, it looks like a tree, uh, and this is really not the best way if you're dealing with Micro, uh, with signals in the microvolts or even millivolts or low millivolts range. If you're only dealing with volts, that, that's no problem at all. So, what is the what would be a better way? So, th this is an example how a typical setup could look like. Um, you have a shielded case, either a metal case or, as I told you, a plastic case with an inside a shielding with a conductive layer, uh, you have, of course, to connect this shielding, either the metal case itself or the conductive coating, at some place you have to connect it to local ground. Then you have your signal coming in, no matter if it's shielded cable or unshielded cable, but one part of your cable also has to be connected to ground usually at the connector. If it's a BNC or a cinch cable, then of course you know where the grounding connection is. And then you have your power supply and your voltage regulators, one or more of them, and your op-amp or other linear circuits. Now, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven parts here that you that have all a connection to ground and what is best to connect them well i'll show you one example there are even whole books written about grounding techniques i will tell you how i made it at my high-end hi-fi stereo amplifier um, which has as i already mentioned which has an input for moving coil stereo pickups, uh, which give only voltages, output voltages in the microvolts region. So it is mandatory to have a, a good grounding so that no outside noise comes in. Now with RCR or XLR connectors, you can use isolated connectors. And not the usual cinch connectors, which are directly bolted to the case. Um, I'll tell you a story. My first pre-amplifier that I built uh, when I was, I don't know, 16 or 17, I used the standard RCR sockets. They were connected with a case by bolting them uh, without any further insulation to the case. And I always had problems of hum, uh, 50 hertz hum, coming into my circuit. And I never could get rid of this. And my the second and hopefully final uh, hi-fi pre-amplifier I built, there I used isolated connectors. And so the connector is not directly bolted uh, to the metal case, uh, but there is a plastic sheet. In between. And so what I did, uh, you know perhaps from if you ever have worked with uh, record players, with phono record players, you know that from your record player you have the two uh, RCR cables, your phono cables for left and right, 
and an additional grounding cable just to uh, give a separate grounding connection with your preamplifier. And at my preamplifier, uh, this is a separate 4mm banana jack, and this is the only place where all of the grounds come together. So for every RCR jack, there goes a separate line here to one point, and then on the PCB, um, and that is where you can see what star grounding means, I took the um, the local ground at the voltage regulators as the star point and from there each op amp or each active circuitry there goes a single ground line to each op amp or each amplifier or whatever and they all meet at one point directly at the voltage regulators and from there goes another thick cable to the 4mm grounding jack. So that is how I got rid of all external hum and noise. And uh, if I find the time I will uh, show you and demonstrate it to you. You only have thermic noise on, on in, in my setup with this connection. So this is just an example, but you have to take care of and the main principle of star grounding is that there's a ground line going to one central point. Here we have two central points. One is for the PCB uh, and it is located, in my case, at the voltage regulators. And from there uh, go single ground lines, separate ground lines to each op amp. And then only one connection to the case where all other for example, I have uh, half a dozen uh, input RCR jacks here and they are all connected with separate lines here at the case grounding. Um, so this is one way. There are other ways how to avoid ground loops in your circuit and uh, if I find the time I give you links to a few downloadable very good op-amp books uh, which also deal with grounding and shielding. But I think the concept became clear. Star grounding means you have one central point and like a, like a star uh, there are separate ground lines going to each component that needs, that needs your positive or negative voltage. So that was it for today. Next time we'll be probably a little bit more about noise and distortion in opamps. I hope you liked it and uh, that was it for today. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye from Roger. Bye from Kanka Labs.